it's, can I say, a tremendous honor to be chosen for this silver medal. And Halle has spoken me up to such an extent that I have something to live up to now. But uh, we, we'll do our best. Whereas my life has been through science, it's been really about taking science out into society. And we should never forget that as, as scientists, even though those things which we bring as scientists, the rigorous approach and so on, they're all part of a broader society where people are different to us, think differently, but yet they are our friends, our family, uh, our colleagues in other ways. Uh, and, and if we don't connect with them, reach out to them, if science becomes something that's tucked away in the corner, then it's really of, of very little use. Um, I would beg your indulgence, if you like. This won't be a talk about science, though it will feature some scientists. Um, and I'll start with, with somebody very close to me, with my own father, who died only 12 weeks ago today, actually, in his 94th year. But he was a scientist. He was an ag analytical chemist by profession who went into agricultural research with the Irish Agricultural Research Institute and devoted his life to soil chemistry, and particularly those minute trace elements, things like manganese and zinc and selenium, we had all of this when we were children, um, which are part of soil, and of course then fundamental parts of nutrition for plants and for animals. And in a sense, they're a little bit like, you know, those carbon dioxide and other tiny elements of the atmosphere, which are only there in parts per million or parts per billion in the case of, of CFCs, and yet have very significant effects on the behavior of the atmosphere. Although he was a, a very active researcher and had something like over 100 published papers, he was never happier than when he was talking to farmers or talking to agricultural advisors. So I didn't have to look very far when I, I was looking for an example of somebody who, if you like, brought science through to, the, to society and was very conscious that all of that scientific work that was being done was very much part of society. And just to show you a picture of, of where he worked, and it's a little bit kind of unusual because most scientists don't work in places like this. Uh, so again, science is part of society. This was a, a manor house, a beautiful grounds uh, outside, uh, five kilometers outside the town, my hometown, which was given over to the Irish state for agricultural uh, research and, and education, in fact, uh, back in the middle of the last century. And it's a wonderful place to visit even still. Uh, so science comes in very strange places, sometimes very unusual places and associated with other unusual things. Um, the town I come from is in the very southeast of Ireland, just uh, in this county here. Uh, a Viking town, actually, uh, probably founded by Danes, now that we're here in Denmark, we should say that, over a thousand years ago. And oddly enough, for, it's a small market town of, of 20,000 people. Um, and yet, bizarrely, the people in that town have done something very strange for the last 60 or 70 years. They've run an opera festival, an, inter an international opera festival. So this small place in, in a corner of a small country is doing something which is quite unusual. And again, being exposed to this as a child, you learn that communication is not necessarily a simple thing because there are so many modes of communication. And in the arts, we learn many of them which are so different from those that we, I suppose, use necessarily as scientists that don't have that rigor, that don't have that uh, you know, scientists, we either write papers or we give talks or whatever. Uh, but, but in the arts, there are so many other ways to communicate. All of these images communicate something. Uh, and these are very powerful. And these are other ways in which we, we communicate as, as people. And I think as scientists, we have to recognize this. We have to recognize that all of these communication means that exist in a sense outside our special areas are still means that in some ways are available to us, not suggesting we write operas about the year of polar prediction, but um, it, we, we have to think of some of the, the ways in which communication works in other contexts. I mean, through this opera festival, I became very much involved with this, which is our art center in Wexford. I was chair of it for many years also. Uh, and through that, I, I got involved in it myself through being involved in a small way, in amateur drama. Uh, but this also hosted many art exhibitions. So you see a painting like this, and you see, again, it's another means of communication. So I was fortunate when I was growing up uh, 
to come from a place and come from a, a background where the many means of communication, both scientific and artistic, if you wish, were, were familiar to me and available to me. As Halle said, uh, I started off my, my forecasting career, as, as most forecasters do, in aviation forecasting. This was a particularly noisy jet, the BAC 111. Some of us older people around will remember it, or even noisier was the Trident, uh, which were regular visitors, uh, obviously, to Dublin Airport when I started there as a forecaster. And you know, aviation, because it's such a technical and safety-driven and, and process-driven uh, activity, the communication, in a sense, is very, very structured. So this sort of thing is, is what we're familiar with as aviation people, the TAF or the METAR, or the SIGMET, and everything, of course, has to be very ordered and structured because, partly because the people using it come from many different cultures, many different languages, and we have to allow for that, and we have to be concise and very particular about how we express our thoughts as forecasters. But it always struck me when, when listening, because when I worked early on in the Aviation Forecast Office, uh, at the time, pilots used to ring us up for briefings, it doesn't happen that much these days now because they get everything on their iPads or whatever. Um, and, and the way in which the forecasters would take that call, you would listen to them and some would be very abrupt, almost saying, well, this is a bloody nuisance. Somebody who comes and wants to talk to me. Whereas, in fact, the whole point of being there is to talk to the pilots and the dispatchers and give them the information they need. And uh, even then, I, I was very conscious that making an effort to just to have a, a very pleasant, warm voice on the telephone uh, was an important part in that sort of person-to-person -person communication. After a couple of years in that, I got involved in, in the general forecasting office. This was a, an old picture of, uh, it's a bit blurry, but um, the gentleman sitting down was our boss at the time. He was an experienced television broadcaster. Uh, here he is in front of, of screens. I mentioned um, the, the title of my talk, Cardboard Charts, because this was the, the, the state of television weather graphics when I started, I hate to say. Uh, back in the mid-1980s, and here indeed is one of those charts, and these charts we used to physically draw by hand um, after doing the analysis in the scientific way, draw a representation of it here, which had to be obviously correct scientifically uh, in terms of putting the fronts and the highs and the lows in the right place, but you were showing it to a general audience, so of course it had to be in some ways simplified, you know, just put in the main, the main pictures, the main features, and don't, uh, don't worry too much about some of the, the finer details. This is another one. So I got involved in, in 1985, very fortunately. Um, so I'll come back to the whole point of, of serendipity uh, later on. Uh, in television weather, we, we had, in Met Aaron, the Irish Met Service, we had um, an arrangement with the Irish broadcaster, uh, RTE, Radio Television Aaron, to supply radio and television forecast and forecasters uh, on air. Uh, and because, you know, I had a little bit of background in amateur drama, it wasn't much. I was never going to challenge Laurence Olivier or, or Richard Burton or anybody like that. But, you know, in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king, and it was probably more than most other people had come into meteorology had. So it was a fairly easy progression for me to make to move into the world of, of TV broadcasting. Um, after a few years, we, we, we progressed the broadcasting from, in, in the early days, it was like one broadcast every night, and if you missed it, it was gone. And this, again, as Bob said, was before we had, uh, or Halle, before we had things in our pockets that told us the weather 24-7 or the ability to look up the internet. You basically had the radio broadcast at certain times, you had the TV broadcast at certain times, and if you weren't there to watch them or listen to them, well, you had to wait till the next day or the next broadcast. Um, but in 1999, we... Uh, 1998, actually. We, uh, pardon me, 1988. I get confused with my decades. That's what happens when you get older. Uh, we upgraded the broadcast service to provide five or six broadcasts a day and put a forecaster for a shift within the broadcast community. And that was a, an eye opener for me because when you come from a med service, and, and this is a very particular type of organization, you're mixing with scientists, you get used to talking as scientists, and then you go into a broadcast organization where it's completely different culturally and people have a, a different mindset, and they're looking at images, and they have strong opinions, which sometimes they don't necessarily have to back up with facts or evidence, as we would wish on, as scientists. So you realize that there's very different people here. So it was a hugely interesting and important 
revelation for me that there was two different worlds and the weather broadcaster in fact has to have a footing in both uh, if you're to be you know, properly rigorous in the sense of a scientist in a forecaster and yet to contribute successfully to what is um, a television show a program and you have to understand the values that come with that which are quite, quite different to the scientific values and it led me to understand a little bit about weather in the media and, and you know the importance of presentation and we have to realize that different drivers are there for different parts, different types of the media. So in television, it's all about visuals. Television is a visual medium. So the images are really what's carrying a large part of the story. When you come to radio, it's about scripting, but it's also about the quality of your voice. Because some voices, you know, they're just great on our ears. And when they do that, what they're saying doesn't get in there. Whereas a voice which is more pleasant and easier on the ear allows the sound, in a sense, to penetrate into the brain. And then print media has different drivers, the web, and, and then the apps. They are all driven by different ways of presenting. So a realization about that helps us to take our message and use each of these media to its best effect. Weather decisions in the media, particularly in newsrooms, are almost basically entirely on their news value. Or will it Will it get the audience? Will it grab them if you put this picture up front? And, and again, that's why most weather images, most weather stories in the news are about disasters. So the pictures of the hurricane and the reporter hanging onto the tree and all these, these are almost cliches, but in some ways that's what drives the news value and why in some ways it's so much more difficult to get news stories about things like climate change and whatever, which are much longer term changes and which don't immediately invite or bring forward strong imagery, if you like, which can be used. Uh, so quality of visuals, quality of presentation. Now over time, of course, media has changed and television was very much the dominant medium through, I suppose, the latter part of the 20th century. Uh, but as we've gone, even in the television context, we've seen the computer graphics become you know, incredible compared to what we, we thought we might have back in the 80s and the 90s, where we can take the model data put it into a graphic machine, create these whole three-dimensional uh, images, <coughs> fly through them and all sorts of, I'm not sure it always tells the story well, that's, a, that's another point, but uh, that's the case. And then the global reach of broadcasters now, where the whole concept of a national broadcaster is becoming not quite redundant, but certainly much weaker because there are so many international uh, CNNs, BBCs, were the first to go down that road, um, but you have so many now that you can, so, so Again, this is important for weather broadcasting because weather is local. The people are really mostly interested in whether they can get home dry or do whatever they want to do without being blown over or not crash on the road because it's not icy or whatever. So this mismatch between, in a sense, the global reach of many broadcasters now and the local need of forecasters for forecasting for people is, is still, I think, uh, a problem. Uh, the climate change debate, well, that, that's, we'll come back to that in a while, uh, but again, media finds it difficult to deal with this without kind of touching on the political side because that's where the news values is, and that, that is a very difficult place for us to go as, as forecasters. So weather and media is challenging, challenging for both sides because um, as, as we have to adapt to the media, so the media have to adapt to some extent to us, uh, and we have to understand fundamentals in the media like time. If you're given one minute 30, do a broadcast, you've got 1 minute 30. It's not 1 minute 31, it's not 1 minute 52, it's 1 minute 30. You've got to understand that the media works in radio and television anyway to very, very precise and strict timetables and work within that. And if you've got a complex message, you've really got to simplify it. How much will people be able to take out of this in 90 seconds? Will we be able to give two messages, three messages in that time? And if so, then that's what we have to focus on. And something I still look at whenever I look, watch a broadcast, a TV broadcast particularly, I say, is this about the weather or is it about the presenter? Because if it's the latter, then I'm not really interested. Uh, it's whether the weather broadcast is used as a vehicle to promote the personality. You need a bit of that because people like personalities, but if it goes beyond a certain point and it's more about the personality than about the subject matter, then for me at least, it's not a successful weather broadcast. So. When we deal with media as well, we have to remember that we're dealing with organizations which are 
an end user to us in some ways. And yet beyond that is the ultimate end user, the listener, the viewer. And in some ways that gives us a difficulty in weather broadcasting that we have to think of both. We have to satisfy both. We have to satisfy both the organizational needs of the broadcaster, but also beyond that, the needs of the viewer or the listener. And all of this kind of brought us together as weather broadcasters in, in the 90s. As, as Halle mentioned, 1994, we formed the International Association of Broadcast Meteorology as, as a forum for weather broadcasters to come together and discuss. And we found that you know many of us that came from the meteorological background, some came from a journalistic background. And those of us who at least were serious about our work certainly had a very common understanding of the issues and challenges that faced us. And it gives us and still gives us uh, an opportunity to discuss. We'll be having an IABM meeting here on Wednesday after the media session on uh, Wednesday afternoon. As Halle mentioned, I was very, very fortunate again, this is where serendipity comes in, uh, through the IABM to become introduced to WMO because Halle had just begun in the early to mid 90s to establish the WMO Public Weather Services Program uh, with huge encouragement from John Zillman, who was president of WMO at that time and, and the wonderful president he was and he was very very convinced Australian uh, gentleman uh, very convinced of that need for meteorology to work harder at its outreach and Halle got the job uh, this is Halle with uh, her last year's presentation in Budapest uh, represented uh, visually and through Halle's work in, in the public weather service and have been hugely fortunate in my career to have had that opportunity to work with her for over two decades in WMO. And indeed, if I were giving the laudation and she were getting the medal, that would be equally or maybe even more appropriate because she's been the driving force of Public Weather Service in the World Meteorological Organization for that time. She created and drove that program for, for over two decades. It's We're moving into those of you who are in contact with WMO and know that we're moving into very different times at the moment. The whole structure of the technical commissions has been taken apart and will hopefully be put back together again. And, and it's rather uncertain uh, as to where all of this work will, will lead in the future. As Halle said, uh, I'm still involved and hope to be an element of continuity and hoping that the, the, the focus doesn't get diluted, uh, but it's going to be a challenge. So a little bit about communication. I mean, ultimately, communication is simple. It's about getting a thought from here into there, into your brain, from my brain to your brain. Uh, and that sounds straightforward enough, but of course, you know, our brains are very different. You know, we've one idea that we're trying to transmit, but there's two different brains, two different environments. Uh, you might be thinking of something else entirely. You could be from a different culture, different gender, whatever, different background. And, and that will all color the way in which you receive the information, which I'm trying to, to provide to you. Uh, this gentleman, uh, who was Iranian said that uh, in personal communication, only 7% of the communication is transmitted through what you say. 38% roughly, he reckoned, I mean, these percentages obviously are, are not exact, how you say it. And all the rest is how you look when you're saying it. It's the scary stuff, you know? Uh, it, it takes us an awful long way from the way we communicate as scientists, where we write everything and present things in a very rigorous manner. Uh, th this idea that how we appear and how we sound actually has a fundamental importance in the effectiveness of our communication. And what it really means is that this communication is two-way. So while I'm looking at you and talking to you, I should be getting something back from you, hopefully you know, something active that you're actually listening. And, and, and that, if that if that listening side is, is broken, if, if that doesn't work properly, then you know the, the forward communication isn't going to work either. So for me, actually, the, this is the most important element, or most important organ for good communication is actually listening. Uh, if, we, if we talk less and listen more, often we communicate more effectively because the person to whom we're listening will actually tune into us better when we have something to say. If we say too much and they're not listening, then we're just wasting our time. So we need to, if you like, not have this brick wall in the return cycle of that communication paradigm. Coming back to meteorology um, and, and 
weather services and public weather services, we, we shouldn't forget that you know, a lot of it started operational meteorology with this event here, which was back in the middle of the uh, 1800s with the wreck of a ship off the coast of Anglesey in North Wales and the loss of many lives, loss of cargo, loss of value, of course. And that was what prompted Admiral Fitzroy to, who had been a kind of a climatologist, as we said now, a, a statist, he was a statistician looking at, at numbers. So he, he, he then turned from that to operational forecasting. He decided rather than be a scientist just looking at scientific stuff, he would try and put that to some use and started this operational forecasting. Of course, that became a forerunner of the UK Met Office. Now, we talk about Fitzroy in the Anglophone, but there was others in other countries, in, in the US, in, in France, and so on, <coughs> in, in the Netherlands, doing similar sorts of development and laying the foundation for what we now know as operational meteorology. But we shouldn't forget that it started with a problem. It started with the problem that ships were being lost, lives were being lost, and arguably the next big step forward in operational meteorology came with aviation, which again was a problem. There needed to be good meteorology to help aircraft in the early days of the early to middle part of the 20th century to get from A to B safely when aviation was still very much in its infancy. So this public weather services is now developed in, in WMO uh, to become something called service delivery. And it's kind of moved center stage in WMO. Um, and it's a broader concept it's, it's still the same thing. It's about good communication. It's about taking what we do and communicating it properly. Operational meteorology has always had an element of service delivery, but in some ways, I think in, in the last 50 or 60 years, when we've had that tremendous improvement that, that Bob has showed us in, in the technology of meteorology, maybe we've got a little bit further away from the need to actually transmit the benefits of all that properly to society. This is one of my favorite analogies, and apologies to those who haven't heard it before. So if we think about pizza, so it's, uh, as probably will happen a couple of evenings this week, you might be thinking about going off for a pizza afterwards. So you, um, you order in a pizza, you ring up your local pizzeria or your Uber Eats or Deliveroo or whoever these days happens to deliver pizza. So what do we need to have a nice evening? Obviously we've opened our bottle of wine, we're sitting there at home waiting for our pizza. So firstly, the one we ordered should be the one that we get. Seems basic. Uh, should be nice, tasty. Uh, should arrive hot. And should arrive on time, so we're not sitting there looking at our watches saying all this. But if we look at those four qualities, there's really only one of them depends on the chef, and that's the second one. So the chef can make a fine pizza, but if it's not the pizza you wanted, if it's late, if it's cold, you're not going to be happy. So this is a bit like the forecaster. The forecaster can make a really good forecast, but if it's not delivered on time, if it's not what the person wants, if they can't understand it, it its value is not there. And we put so much effort into the scientifically creating the value, potential value of forecasts in, in improving the models and improving the observation system. And there's such a, an investment, scientific financial investment has gone into those that I feel if we don't match it with good presentation, then we're basically just losing that value. We're letting the side down scientifically. So management of that pizza establishment had to think about having a clear ordering system so that they could match the order to the person. They had to uh, have some means by which when you phone up, they'll say, yeah, we'll have it for you in 20 minutes or 30 minutes or 40 minutes, whatever it was, some way of estimating that. They had to get some transport system sorted and they had to make sure that the delivery area drivers knew where to get from A to B. So there was lots of other things they had to do other than decide what quality of tomato sauce or what quality of cheese and so on will I put on my pizza. Uh, so all of these things were additional, but they're all fundamental to the service. So a good product, and we have wonderful products now, does not necessarily translate into a good service. It's a necessary, but not a sufficient condition, I suppose we might say mathematically. A good service starts with thinking first and foremost about the client, about the user. And that service delivery is not something we think about afterwards. It should be fundamental into how we design everything in our systems, even down to where we put our observing stations. We must remember that all of this is there for a reason. It's there to serve the public. So service delivery, it's, you could look at it as window dressing, but 
you know, presentation, branding, marketing, all of these things. But really, I think it's more than that. And it has to reach back into how we organize ourselves operationally, how we set up our MET services. Of course, we have scientific priorities, but we have service priorities too. And our products, which are really good now, are just one part of that forecast delivery system. So diagrammatically, we could look at this. This is, if you like, the chain of, of uh, operational meteorology, starting with observations and going through modeling and forecasting and service delivery. But in fact, it's, it's only a part of a much bigger chain, which goes through to the users and how they actually take in that information, and what decisions they make, and the outcomes of their decision. And hopefully, at the end of it, there's some sort of value there for society. And it's in that value for society that we justify our science and our work in, in an operational sense. So if we want to communicate to decision makers, and again, going back to this idea of kind of this brain, this getting a thought from my brain into yours, they have so many other things that are going on in their lives, the decision makers, about policies and cultures and values and risk and things like that, that we have to be a bit aware of all that uh, if we're going to communicate properly, give them the information they need at the time they need it in a manner that they can actually make use of it. That at least is, is what we, the holy grail of what we should be trying to do. I mentioned briefly climate change, and this of course is the Keeling curve, and to some extent I think this represents a failure on the part of myself and others who are involved in communication in our science. Because if we had been more successful around about 1990, that curve should have turned, we should have seen an inflection point around, it should have started to flatten, because we knew back then what was happening. We knew back then the challenge that climate change posed, but we couldn't or didn't communicate it effectively to society in a way that society changed. And for all of the talk about climate change and doing this and doing that, and, and there are many, many wonderful um, initiatives, you know, once this thing keeps going up, we're failing. And that, I think, is a very sobering way to think of, of, you know, communication is it's a very different thing in that context, I know, and very difficult. And obviously, as we know, there are many, many strong forces and many very well-resourced forces ranged against us as a scientific community when we come to talk about climate change. Uh, but, but this, unfortunately, for me, uh, represents something of a failure. I'll finish briefly now that, um, as I've been presented with this medal, I feel kind of like a bit of an elder statesman or something like that, or an old codger. Um, and maybe just a message for some of the younger people, and this is one of the reasons I love coming to this conference every year, is so many young researchers, postgraduates, postdoctorates, working in universities are here, and it's just wonderful to see that life in meteorology, in a sense. This gentleman, uh, Nicholas Taleb, is a Lebanese, uh, who was actually a trader, on the stock markets in the US, and he uh, got very interested in this question of uncertainty and so on, and he wrote a few books about that. This is one of them, um, where he basically said, look, an awful lot that happens in life happens purely by chance, and we can't really roll the dice so that it'll always come in our favor, and we have to just accept that, um, which was an odd kind of a thing, maybe for somebody who was making his life telling his clients that if they gave them their millions, they, he, could, he could increase it on the stock market. He's now a professor of uncertainty or something in one of these US. But uh, recipes for success, again, for the younger people particularly, uh, make time for the things you enjoy, if that's science, of course, but there should be other things in your life as well as science. Meet lots of people, because the more you meet, the more opportunities will come your way, and you don't know whether the person you're talking to this evening at the icebreaker reception will be somebody who will be important in your life. I never knew when I met Halle first, that uh, we would become such colleagues and, and good friends over the decades, but uh, these, these are important. Go to parties as much as possible. Um, you know, lectures are good, but parties are good too. Get out there. Uh, become a good listener. When you're talking to somebody, make sure to make time for them to talk and for them to listen. And enthusiasm, never forget that enthusiasm is a wonderful driver of human and personal and even scientific relations it goes a long way. So it's been my great honor to accept this medal. It's been my great honor to talk to you. And I hope that for uh, a few more years, at least, I can be an adequate representative of this wonderful science and profession. Thank you.
Right, Gerald, thank you very much. I know it was a really inspiring talk, and I think it's given us much to, to think about. And uh, I think you can now see why Gerald was given the, the silver medal. It was outstanding. So thank you, thank you very much. Uh, we've all learnt a lot from what you've said. But that does bring us to the end of this morning's session. And so it's time for lunch. So thank you for, for coming and listening and participating in this morning's session.